And all I can say after that last presentation by Russ is, wow, that was really something. It reminded me of something that happened to my wife and I early last year. We flew out to Las Vegas to attend a Bible prophecy conference, and I decided to stay over a day to go see the Boulder Dam because I'd never seen it. And so we got in a tourist bus, about 50 of us, and we started out across the desert. And the bus driver was giving a commentary as we went along. And he said, folks, I want to tell you something that's going to be very hard to believe. He said, there is overwhelming evidence that all this desert you see out here was covered by water over 200 million years ago. <laughs> as Russ said, he almost got it right. <laughs> Uh, I uh, would like to encourage you to go to our, I don't know what's going on here, something, let's see, um, got things uh, stopped up here for some reason, just a moment, always something going wrong with these things, uh, here we go, yeah, let's see, still not working. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I may have to reboot this thing. I don't know. Can't uh, get anything out of it. Let's see. Let's see here. If the tech guys had come down here and helped me, we might get this going. Oh, here. We, I think that may do it. I don't know. Let's see. I don't know what's going on. Not working. Do you want to just close it and reopen it? See if that yeah, helps? they won't do it. It won't do anything. Oh, it's completely locked up. It's huh? locked up. Yeah, it might do it. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Here we go. All right. I'd like to encourage you to go to Lamb and Lion Ministries and check it out. We have a man on the, uh, main, uh, Dr. Nathan Jones, who's on that website constantly, and he can answer questions for you, and you can access uh, videos and television programs, and there's a high-speed search engine. Type in a word like rapture, and all kinds of resources will come up. Uh, my presentation this afternoon is going to be based on this book, Nine Wars of the End Times, and we've already sold out, so I apologize for that. So if there's any of our books that we brought that you'd like to get, you can get them over the Internet. I mentioned this morning that I have a collection of over 900 church signs, and the way that began was in uh, we founded this ministry in May of 1980, and uh, one month later, a man called and said, are you on the radio? And I said, no. And he said, well, you need to be on the radio. God spoke to me. I was listening to one of your tapes. And he said, get this guy on the radio. And I said, well, I don't have any money. He said, well, I'll send you a check and you get on the radio. And he said, don't you ever call me and ask me for any more money. I said, I didn't call you in the first place. Huh? <laughs> I found out he really meant that because every year, I, every year I would send him a letter in January and say, we're now on 50 stations. We're now on 80 stations. We're now on 100 stations. And he'd always write back and say, praise the Lord. That was it. <laughs> but having never met him or anything, he sent me a check for $4,000 and we used that to get on the radio in Dallas. And I spent the first six months talking about the signs of the times that point the soon return of Jesus. At the end of that time, a lady wrote me and she said, boy, you are really obsessed with signs. Said, I, uh, I uh, got one I want you to see. And she sent me this first sign, Little Hope Baptist Church. And I, I thought, man, I, don't, I want to be a member of Big Hope Baptist Church, not a Little Hope. And so I, uh, I read it on the radio. And then the signs started flowing in. And the next one was Halfway Baptist Church. I want to get all the way there, not halfway. How about this? Blackjack Baptist Church. I could not believe that. Here's a good one, the Beaver Lick Christian Church. And this is one of my latest that I just got, and that's the PD Baptist Church. 
Unfortunately, all across America today, we have more and more churches like this one, the Church of the Uncertain. <laughs> and one day, my wife and I were driving back from a conference, and we got right outside of Dallas near Greenville, and all of a sudden, I slammed on the brakes and pulled over the side of the road, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I just saw a church sign. I got a photograph. And it was a sign pointing down a gravel road. And I don't believe it, but here it is. The Battle Axe Church. <laughs> a warm country welcome awaits you at the non-denominational Battle Axe Church. I've heard of those churches, and I've even visited, I even remember one one time, but we didn't advertise it. How about this one, the boring United Methodist Church? I've been at several of those. This next one says, you better keep your sign up to date. The First Congregational Meth Church. Uh, boy, I bet, they're, I bet they're jumping the pews and hanging from the chandeliers there. One day I was sitting at my desk and I thought of a church name and I said, no, no, nobody would ever have that name. No one. It, no one. So I tapped it into Google and up top that popped that name of a church in Florida. The Laodicean Missionary Baptist Church. What, have they ever read the book of Revelation? I mean, come on. And speaking of the book of Revelation, Andy was talking about plain sense, uh, uh, literal interpretation of Scripture, and it reminded me one of my favorite quotes from Henry Morris, the founder of the Institute for Creation Research. He's had this to say about the book of Revelation. He said, the book of Revelation is not difficult to understand. It is difficult to believe. If you will believe it, you will understand it. And I, that said, amen. That, that's really true. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the wars of the end times. And uh, I'm going to point out that uh, there, uh, there are eight that I think that are absolutely certain. And there's one that's rather uncertain. But uh, I, since I covered it in my book, I called it the nine wars of the end times. Let's pray. Lord, I come to you in the name of Jesus and thank you for the wonderful worship that we have experienced, the great fellowship. Uh, I just thank you for this wonderful church staff that works behind the scenes to make everything possible and all the hard work they've done. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the meal that we had today at noon. And we thank you for the speakers and for what they've had to say. And we just pray, Lord, that you will bless this presentation to your name's honor and glory and touch souls for eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, every time I war breaks out in the Middle East, I immediately receive a flurry of phone calls, email messages, all kinds of contacts asking, is it the war of Armageddon? That's always the question I get, because that's about the only war of the end times that anyone knows anything about. So everybody asks about, is it the war of, the, uh, of, of Armageddon? And of course, there's other reasons they ask that, and that's because this particular battle of Armageddon has become so famous that you know, there are movies main, named after Armageddon, and people have, even who don't know anything about the Bible are familiar with the term Armageddon. Uh, so it's been popularized uh, greatly. But it comes out of Revelation and it comes out of Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16, which it says in Hebrew, it speaks of a place called Har Megiddo, or the mountain of Megiddo is what that really is. This is an aerial photograph of Megiddo. Probably many of you have been there if you've been on a tour to Israel. This uh, particular uh, great fortress uh, overlooks the entire uh, valley of Jezreel or the valley of Armageddon. The Valley of Jezreel runs diagonally across Israel. Uh, it starts up at the uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea at Mount Carmel and runs uh, sort of south uh, uh, east there and then across to the Jordan River. And you can see where Megiddo is circled there and it overlooks the entire valley. This is a photograph of the valley. It's really an awesome place, just absolutely awesome. This is a, a picture of it from Mount Carmel. And uh, this is uh, where... Uh, Napoleon fought a war here. He fought against the Turks here, and he said that he considered this the greatest battlefield he had ever seen in his entire life. Now, again, I'm going to be talking about the nine wars of the end times, and the most, most prophetic scholars have long believed 
that the next great war that's going to occur, the, the, the first of the, of the end time wars, will be the war of Gog and Magog, which I'm sure all of you have heard much about. And again, thinking of, of literal interpretation of Scripture reminds me of the fact that many times um, Schofield, who put out the Schofield Study Bible in 1909, he was asked about this war, and people would say, how can it be? He said, you, you teach that in the end times Russia is going to invade Israel. And they said, that's just absolutely nonsense. And he said, well, I realize that, but the Bible says it, and therefore I believe it, and it's going to happen. Well, why would they consider it nonsense? Well, in 1909, Russia was a Christian Orthodox state, and Israel did not exist. And most people considered there was no prospect Israel would ever exist. So why is a Christian Orthodox nation going to invade a nation that doesn't exist? Today we don't even stop and think about that because we know that Russia is a terrible enemy of Israel. And Russia, according to the Scriptures, is going to lead a great coalition of nations to invade Israel in the end times. Now Joel Rosenberg in his uh, great book, Epicenter, uh, he believes that this is going to be the next war of the end, uh, of the, the first war of the end times. And it will happen soon. Uh, the war will be when Russia invades Israel with certain specified allies. And as you know, all of those allies are Muslim states. So that is the, the nature of the God, war of Gog and Magog. And, but the, the thing about this particular war is that I doubt that the conflict described there will be the next war of, or the first war of end time Bible prophecy. And the reason I feel that way, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is that the, it says over and over in the uh, uh, Bible that it will happen at a time uh, when Israel will be living securely in unwalled villages. As a result of that, many Bible prophecy scholars in the past, uh, I would say in the early 20th century, late 19th century, all took the same position that Dr. Walver did when he wrote about this. And that is that this war would begin immediately after the beginning of the tribulation. Uh, because it says Israel will be living in peace. And so the idea was the Antichrist is going to sign a treaty uh, with uh, the Jewish people that will guarantee their security and they will be living safely for the first time and then the war will begin. And that was the position of most prophetic scholars in the late 19th and early 20th century. But that has changed some uh, in recent years, and I'll explain why in a moment. The point I want to make right now, though, is the nation of Israel is not secure, either internally or externally, as the current war clearly illustrates. Internally, there has always been the constant threat of terrorism. Externally, there is the constant threat of missile attacks from Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the nation of Iran. Israel was born in war, and Israel has lived in war ever since the nation was birthed. There was the War of Independence in 1948 and 49, the Suez War in 1956, the Six-Day War in 1967, the War of Attrition from 67 to 70, the Yom Kippur War of 1973, the Lebanese War of 1982, the First Arab Intifada, Arab Uprising from 87 to 93, the Second Arab Intifada from 2000 to 2004, the Hezbollah War of 2006, the First Hamas War of 2008, and now the Second Hamas War of 2023 and 24. A nation that has lived constantly in war. And you know this is a fulfillment of prophecy because it says in Isaiah that the nation will be born in one day and it says the birth pangs will come after its birth. Not before but after its birth. And that's exactly what happened. The birth pangs began the day after the Declaration of Independence and have continued to this day. Israel is the only nation I know where every town now is being built out of reinforced concrete. All houses have to be out built out of reinforced concrete. It is the only nation I know of where every apartment building, every office building, every community building of any kind is required to have a bomb shelter. It's a nation so insecure that it has a, a, a wall meandering 400 miles down the center of the country to protect its citizens from terrorists. In fact, I would argue that Israel is currently the most insecure 
uh, nation and is probably uh, more insecure than ever before for two reasons. One, because of missile launchers on the part of its enemies. In the past when wars would go on, I would take groups over there while the war was going on. No problem at all because there were no missiles. But today there are missiles and you can't take a group over there while war is going on because a missile could land any time anywhere. A second reason Israel is so insecure today is because we have a government that continues to waver in its support of Israel. This has been true ever since Obama came to power. Now uh, let's just talk for a moment about uh, the Russian allies of Ezekiel 38 and 39. This is the second reason uh, that I uh, doubt uh, that this war is going to occur real soon, and that is that uh, uh, the allies are not all together yet. But anyway, who are going to be the allies during this time? Well, it's going to be Iran, Persia. It's going to be Kush, which is modern-day Sudan. It's going to be Put, which is possibly, li uh, certainly Libya, and possibly Algeria, and and uh, uh, Tunisia, and the two regions that lie within modern-day Turkey, they are Gomer and Beth Togomar. As you can see, none of these Russian allies, none, has a common border with Israel, not a single one. Specifically, there is no mention at all that's made of Jordan, that's made of Egypt, that's made of uh, Syria, of Lebanon, or of Gaza. None of those nations are mentioned as being a part of the War of Gog and Magog. It's an outer circle of nations that come down with Russia. This produces an important question. Why is it that none of the nations located next to Israel are mentioned as allies of Russia? Well, one explanation of this mystery is supplied by Bill Solis. Many of you are familiar with him. It was in his book called Israel Stein. He proposed that the next end time prophetic war will be one that's described in Psalm 83. It's a war of Israel and its adjacent neighbors. All of those mentioned there, he argues, have a common boundary with Israel. And he believes this part, uh, war will produce the conditions of peace. That war that During this war that Israel will defeat all of the nations around it that have a common boundary and Israel will then have peace. And it's at that point that the Russians will come down against uh, Israel. So the first war of the end times that I would mention, which is an iffy war because uh, prophetic scholars are not agreed on this, is the war of Psalm 83. Some argue that so that uh, the war described in Psalm 83 uh, occurred in biblical times. Some argue that uh, it was the Six-Day War of 1967, that although all the nations there were not did not invade Israel, the, the people who argue for 1967 say that it was all the nations mentioned and the ones that weren't mentioned were working behind the scenes to help those who did invade. So that's one of the arguments. There are some who just simply say it has nothing to do with any war whatsoever. It's just talking about general enemies against Israel. So there are many different interpretations. And in the book that I wrote, I go into detail about that and show all the different interpretations. But uh, Let's just assume for a moment that it might be the first war of the end times, and it is a war that's described in Psalm 83 whose purpose is to wipe out Israel as a nation. That's the specific purpose that is mentioned in the psalm. And the ones that are going to come will be Lebanon, they will be Syria, be Jordan, be Egypt, and be Gaza, the nations with a common border. And Zechariah 12, 6 says that in the end times Israel will be like a fire pot among pieces of wood and a flaming torch among sheaves so that they will consume on the right hand and on the left all the surrounding peoples. I mention that because Psalm 83 does not tell how this war will turn out. It mentions nothing about that. But there are several passages like this. This is not the only one. There are several passages like this that say Israel is going to be like David against Goliath in the end times against all of its enemies and that no one will be able to to beat uh, Israel in the end times. Hamas should have read that before they launched their attack. In the current, is the current war in the Middle East, the war of Psalm 83? I don't think so, so far. We have to wait and see how it develops. It could come to a screaming halt. On the other hand, it could uh, extend and other nations get involved. So you might watch it and see, because we don't know for sure if this is really going to be one of the wars of the end times. But my speculation is that if it does occur and the nations uh, that attack are all defeated, all of the enemies of Israel right around it with a common border, I have no doubt whatsoever that what will happen next. And that is 
they will appeal to their natural uh, ally to come to the rescue. And their natural ally is Russia. So Psalm 83 may be the thing that would cause them to turn to Russia and say, please come to our aid. And that, if so, we're talking here about the first uh, war of Gog and Magog, the first war of Gog and Magog, which is described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, where Russia and its Muslim allies come down against Israel in the end times. And there's quite a number of nations that join them. And all of these nations today are Muslim nations that will jo join Russia in this attack on Israel in the end times. And it says in Ezekiel 38, 12, that the Russians will come to capture spoil and to seize plunder. And there are many ideas about that, the riches of the Dead Sea, the great gas uh, uh, discoveries that Israel has made in recent years, and I'm sure all of those would play a role. But it could well be the fact that uh, Russia just simply wants to move forces into the Middle East. They've always wanted to go in there in order to capture the oil fields of the Middle East. And this Arab invitation to come and help us would simply be an open door for them to send their troops and to take over the Middle East and get those oil fields. But we know that will not happen because the Scriptures say that this is going to be a war that's going to be one that uh, will wipe out the Russian forces and all those who come with them. That God will intervene and that God will defeat them and that He will defeat them in such a way that even the Jewish people will realize that the defeat came from God and not from the IDF. And I think that probably will open some hearts to the gospel and maybe some of those 144,000 Jews who will be believers during the tribulation, this may be the event that will cause them to begin to seriously consider God and the Scriptures. So there's going to be a tremendous response by God here, and it says specifically that the invading armies will be destroyed, it says, uh, by a tremendous earthquake. It emphasizes over a tremendous earthquake will occur in the Middle East. It also says that there will be pestilence and hailstorms and fire and brimstone and battlefield confusion, and all of this will result in the, uh, uh, the defeat of the Russian forces. Let me just uh, pause here for a moment and, and in, entertain a thought with you. And that is that because the earthquake is emphasized so strongly, and because it says that this earthquake will be so strong that every wall in Israel will fall down, it says. Well, I got to think about that one day, and I thought, you know, that could be the fate of this particular Muslim institution. Uh, if every wall in Israel is coming down, uh, this may be when this thing will collapse. And uh, of course, again, Ezekiel 38, 19 and 20, in my zeal, in my blazing fury, I've spoken that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, and the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the ground, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will quake at my presence. The mountains also will be pulled down, the steep pathways will fall, and every wall will fall to the earth. This uh, I don't know how this, this building could survive that, and that would pave the way not only for the peace treaty with uh, Israel, but also uh, to allow the Israelis to build their temple. Now, there's no doubt this is going to be a great war of the end times. The first one I mentioned, Psalm 8, is doubtful, but this one is not. What's doubtful about this is its timing. Nobody knows the timing. Everybody has a different timing idea, but all of them are speculative in nature. Because we just don't know for sure the timing. We just know that it's going to be a time when Israel is living in peace. So what about the timing? Well, the best book that I have ever read about the timing is this one, Northern Storm Rising by Ron Rhodes. I think Ron Rhodes is one of the finest teachers in Bible prophecy today. Uh, he's a great man of God, and he's written, he makes his living just writing uh, books about Bible prophecy. And uh, what he has to say in this book about the timing of, of the uh, War of Gog and Magog, I found very interesting. He pointed out, say the tribulation there is seven years long, he, he pointed out that the Jews will spend seven years burning the weapons, perhaps nuclear fuel, I don't know, but seven years burning the weapons that are captured in the war. Now, when are they going to burn those seven years of records? When are they going to do that? He said, well, look at this. 
in the middle of the tribulation that Antichrist is going to turn against the Jews and start killing them off like mad, and the Jews are going to be evicted from the land. They're going to run to Jordan to hide so you don't have seven years to deal with this matter of burning the weapons. So he said that he believes that the war with Gog and Magog is going to start th at least three and a half years before the tribulation begins. That would give the Jews seven years to clean up the battlefield and to clean up all these uh, weapons. Three and a half years before the tribulation starts and three and a half years into the tribulation. Does this mean the wars of Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 and 39 must occur before the rapture? Absolutely not. The rapture is an event that can occur any moment, any time. It could happen before this presentation is over with, and I hope it will. But uh, <laughs> it, uh, it just happens any time during that time. Now, the uh, third war that I want to mention is the conventional war of the tribulation, and that is described, I believe, in Revelation chapter 6. This is the war of the Antichrist uh, that begins to take over the world. The Antichrist is going to rise to power in, uh, in uh, Europe. He's going to rise to power through the use of his charismatic personality and his great wisdom of help sol solving problems, probably dealing with the rapture. I think there's going to be a gap between the rapture and the tribulation. The rapture does not begin the tribulation. The tribulation begins when the Antichrist signs a treaty with Israel. There has to be a gap. Maybe it's two years, three years, who knows? But there has to be a gap where the whole world is in confusion and chaos. The Antichrist comes. He has the answer to all the questions, all the problems, and the world is kind of goes gaga over him. And uh, he rises to power in Europe and consolidates his power using the European Union as his base. But let me tell you something, folks. The rest of the world is not going to be impressed with the Antichrist's charismatic personality and all that. Africa, Asia, and Latin America have spent 200 years fighting to get under, out from underneath European colonialism. They're not suddenly going to run to some new European r ruler and bow down and say, please come and rule us. He's going to have to conquer them. And I believe the seal judgments are a description of a war that the Antichrist launches to conquer the whole world. I believe it is a conventional war. And that's the reason that I called it the conventional war of the tribulation. It's a conventional war, and he tries to conquer all the world during that particular time. And uh, it is a war that is, uh, says the Antichrist will ultimately achieve authority over every tribe and every people and every tongue and every nation, but it's going to take a while to do that. So he's going to begin with this conventional war, which I believe is described by the seal judgments. And uh, the Psalm 83 war may be going to prepare the way for this. Again, as I said, all these particular nations are not involved in this war. Going back, I've already made that point. But here's the point I want you to keep in mind. And that is that if this happens, as I think it's going to happen, that the Muslim nations of the Middle East, that all the Arab nations are going to be wiped out, let's say in Psalm 83. And if not then, in the first war being the conventional war, if that happens, the Muslim world is not wiped out. The largest Muslim nation in the world is Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest one. It has a population of 200 million Muslims. The second largest Muslim nation is India. The third largest Muslim nation is Pakistan. The fourth largest is, the, is uh, Bangladesh. So your largest Muslim nations are not in the Middle East. They're all over in Southeast Asia. And he's going to have to deal with them. I suspect that the greatest enemies of the Antichrist will be the Muslims. Here is a man who declares himself to be God. And the moment he does that in the middle of the tribulation, the Jews immediately reject him and he attacks them. Certainly the Muslims are going to be filled with anger that any man would declare himself to be God. And I think that God is going to work through the Antichrist to destroy the Muslim world during the tribulation, that he's going to be God's hammer against the Muslim world. And it's going to begin with this first war, which is the war of the sealed judgments. And that is going to be quite a war, because that war is going to result in one-fourth of humanity killed 
And in a moment that, uh, that would result in about one and a half billion people. And I'll explain those numbers in just a moment. Okay. I think that will morph then. I believe the, the conventional war is going to morph into a nuclear war. And that nuclear war will be the trumpet judgment. Why do I believe that? For several reasons. First of all, there's no weapons that we have that man will not use. I think it's the restraining hand of God that has kept us from using nuclear weapons since the times of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've been on the verge several times. We are on the verge right now. Did you know this nation is subject to attack as never, ever before in our history? We've always had the oceans, but we don't have the ocean protection anymore. We have these tremendous missiles that Russia and China have developed that uh, used to missiles went up like this and came down like this. Now they're going like this at ultrasonic sounds. And they can come right across the ocean and hit us. And we are vulnerable as never before. And nuclear weapons, I believe, will be used during the tribulation. And there are several evidences of this happening. One of them is the fact that it mentions that one third of the world at that time of those remaining after the seal, after the first conventional war, one third of those still alive are going to die. Now let's look at these numbers for a moment. Now these are some calculations I made. The current population of the world is seven and a half billion people. Let's assume that one and a half billion are taken out during the rapture. That's just an assumption. I hope there are that many true believers on earth. But anyway, let's say that's an assumption here. So those left behind are going to be 6 billion people at the beginning of the tribulation. 6 billion on planet earth. The seal judgments, the first conventional war, one-fourth of those are going to be killed. That's 1.5 billion. That leaves 4.5 billion. Then it says the trumpet judgments, which I believe is going to be the morphing into a nuclear war, is going to kill a third of those left. That's another 1.5 billion. And at that point, at the middle of the tribulation, there will be 3 billion people left. We have gone from 6 billion to 3 billion. In three and a half years, one half the population of the earth will be dead. I always think about that because I, I get calls from pastors all the time saying, do you think we're in the tribulation now? And I say, sir, when we go in the tribulation, if you're around, you won't have to call anybody to ask. You'll know that we're in the tribulation. This is going to be a time of absolutely, totally unparalleled horror here on planet Earth. Revelation 8, 7 says, states that the escalation of the war will result in one third of the earth being burned up. And it also uh, says in Revelation chapter 16 that horrible sores are going to break out on people all over the planet. And I think those sores are going to be used as the result of, of nuclear radiation. You see, the experts on nuclear war say if there's all out a nuclear exchange in the United States, there will be so much debris sucked up into the atmosphere that we will have a nuclear winter that the sun will be blotted out. There will be areas of the world where will be freezing diseases, uh, freeze, freezing temperatures that have never had freezing temperatures before. And that, uh, all, that same cloud that is that, uh, full of all this nuclear debris that's blotting out the sun is also going to be irradiating everything underneath it. So the breaking out of sores all over people, it says at the end of the Revelation, is also to me an indication that this could be morphing into a nuclear uh, war. Also something Jesus said in Luke 21, 26, He said that in the end times men will faint. They'll faint from fear over the expectation of things coming up on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So we have the Psalm 83 war perhaps. We have the Gog and Magog war for sure. We have the war of conventional war of the Antichrist, the seal judgments. We have the nuclear war of the Antichrist, and that is the uh, trumpet judgment. So that by the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist will have conquered the world. He will have conquered the world. And then at that point, he will go to Jerusalem, and uh, he will... I'm going to get away ahead of myself here. No, let me uh, talk about the war in the heavens for a moment. Anyway, in the middle of the tribulation, he's going to Jerusalem. He's going to declare himself God. The Jews will reject him. And uh, in the meantime, there's going to be a war in the heavens. That's my fifth war. In Revelation 12, we're told that Satan is going to try one last time to take God's throne. And Michael, the archangel, is going to fight with Satan. The two armies, Michael's armies and Satan's armies, are going to fight in the heavens. This is going to be a supernatural war, not one here on the earth. 
But we're told something very interesting, and that is that Michael, who is presented in the Scriptures as the commander-in-chief, it seems, of God's armies, and also the one who is uh, the uh, protector of Israel, we're told that Michael is going to cast Satan down to earth, and it says, Satan will know his time is short. That means Satan knows Bible prophecy. He doesn't know God's timing. He doesn't go know, know God's timing. But he knows when that happens, his time is short. When he is blocked from heaven and can no longer access the throne of God, he knows his time is short, and he comes down in a rage. He, at that point, he possesses Satan. He empowers, uh, uh, he, not Satan, he, he possesses the Antichrist. He empowers the Antichrist, and the Antichrist is, becomes obsessed with one thing during the second half of the tribulation, and that is the annihilation of of the uh, Jewish people. So Satan will be cast down and he will know his time is short. This brings us to the war against the Jews and the saints in Revelation chapter 12. This would be the sixth war of the end times. And in this particular war, again, I want to emphasize to you how much Satan hates the Jewish people. I mentioned that this morning. I want to mention it again. He hates them because they are God's chosen people. He hates them because it's through them God gave the Scriptures. He hates them because it's through them God gave the Messiah. He hates them because God has pr uh, promised to save a great remnant. But that remnant is going to go through a living hell. There's going to be a holocaust here on this earth even worse than the Nazi holocaust. We're told uh, that there's about 17 million Jews in the world today, and uh, maybe 18 million. That means that about uh, 10 million are going to die during this. It's going to be worse than the Nazi Holocaust. And uh, the Antichrist is going to be the one who is going to go after the Jews and persecute the Jews. In Matthew 24, it says this is the reason that Jesus refers to the last half of the tribulation as the Great Tribulation. Many people teach the last half is going to be worse than the first half. That's not true at all. Uh, both halves are going to be horrible. Jesus was talking to a Jewish audience, and He said to them that the last half of the tribulation is going to be the great tribulation, because that's when they are going to be persecuted during the last half. During the first half, they're going to be protected. But during the last half, the Antichrist is going to go after them, and He's going to try to kill every Jew on planet Earth. Many of those Jews will flee, of course, to uh, Jordan. We know they'll flee to Jordan because we're told in Daniel 11 that the Antichrist will not be allowed to enter the nation of Jordan. And I think that's to protect the Jews. And uh, it could very well be that they would go to this place called Petra, which is a box canyon. Uh, but uh, whether it's there or not, they're going someplace in the area of Jordan, and they will be safe there until the end of the tribulation. Uh, Daniel 11 says, the Antichrist will be prevented by God from conquering Jordan when an end time rebellion breaks out in the Middle East. Zechariah 13 indicates that two thirds of the Jewish people will be killed by the Antichrist during this time, a greater holocaust than the Nazis. And Revelation 12 says the Antichrist will also war against the offspring of Israel. The offspring of Israel. And I think those, and it goes on to say that it's namely those who keep the commandments of God and hold to a testimony of Jesus. So I think it's going to be a war not only against the uh, Jewish people, but it's going to be a war against those who have come to Jesus in the, uh, during the tribulation, who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So it will be a war against the Jews and also against professing Christians. And we know that a great slaughter will take place. Many, many people will be killed. In Revelation 7 we're told a great host will be in heaven standing for God in white robes. And, and, and John's going to ask, uh, who are these people? Who are they? And he's going to be told, the ones that are coming out of the great tribulation who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the Antichrist is going to be very, very active during this time. And he is going to succeed in killing a lot of believers, but he won't kill them all. Okay, the Antichrist one thing, again, that I want to emphasize is that when the Lord does return at the end and He goes, lands on that Mount of Olives, the Jewish people are going to come out and they're going to receive Him as their Messiah and they're going to make that cry that Jesus said, Baruch haba b'ashem Adonai, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. But I'm getting ahead of myself here because there's one more word I want to mention, and that's the seventh one, the Middle East Campaign of the Antichrist, which is described in Daniel chapter 11. We don't have a lot of detail about this, but the best I can put it together based upon my study of international politics 
is that the Antichrist is going to become so obsessed during the last part of the tribulation, so obsessed with killing the Jewish people that people will realize that worldwide this is going to be our opportunity to, opportunity to rebel against uh, this tyrant and possibly overthrow him and get out from underneath his horrendous control. So we know that a rebellion breaks out in the Middle East. We're told in Daniel 11 that the rebellion is led by the king of the north, which is probably Syria, and the king of the south, which is probably, probably Egypt, that Daniel sends a force. I'm, I, I think he will uh, have sent his armies in, and they will go in there to put down this rebellion. And we're told that he goes throughout the Middle East, all the way down to Egypt, and just slaughters everybody in the process who are involved in this rebellion. But it says that when he gets to Egypt, he hears a rumor that upsets him. <laughs> I would think it would. It's a rumor of 200 million, an army of 200 million coming out of, uh, out of the east that are at the Euphrates River ready to come into that area. And as a result of that, the Antichrist immediately retreats from Israel. He goes uh, up to the uh, Valley of Armageddon, and he waits for this huge army to come in. And that leads us to the eighth battle, the battle of Armageddon that is described in Joel 3, Zechariah 14, and Revelation 19. And we're told that this battle really does not occur. There is no such thing as the battle of Armageddon as far as I'm concerned. What happens is that all the armies are there. They're ready to do battle. Jesus returns. And when Jesus returns and lands on that Mount of Olives, when He returns, He speaks a supernatural word. And when He speaks that supernatural word, 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says, The Lord annihilates all of them in a microsecond with the breath of his mouth. Joel in chapter 3 says, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And Isaiah says the result will be a wasting disease. In fact, Zechariah describes it like a neutron bomb goes off and all these people just suddenly drop dead uh, instantly. It, it says uh, like... Uh, it says that their eyeballs, that their sockets, their eyeballs will melt in their sockets, their tongues in their mouth, their flesh will fall to the ground, that there will be blood as far as a distance of 200 miles. It's going to be a terrible, terrible moment. But I don't think it's going to be in a great battlefield, uh, 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 battle on a battlefield of armies. Jesus doesn't need an army. This is the one who spoke and the whole world came into creation and he will speak and the whole of these armies will be instantly destroyed. That brings us to good news. I do, have, I do have good news. The millennial reign of Jesus Christ comes after that battle when the swords will be beaten into plowshares. What a wonderful day that would be. I love this illustration of it. Uh, on the left you see the swords uh, beat into plowshares. In the middle you see the wolf lying down with the lamb. I love that. You know, every, day, every Christmas we get people calling and say, I know it says somewhere in the Bible, the lamb is going to lie down with the lion. Where does it say it? You, you should know. That's the name of your ministry. And we have to give them the terrible, terrible news that there is no such verse in the Bible. It doesn't say the lion is going to lie down with the lamb. It says the wolf is going to lie down with the lamb because that's the lamb's natural enemy. I even had a woman argue with me. She said, I get a Christmas card every year that has that picture on it. The Bi verse has got to be in the Bible. <laughs> no, no, it's not there. But anyway, the whole animal kingdom is going to be put back, as, as uh, Russ just said, to its original condition where they live in peace with each other and with man. And, and, and on the far right you see a young boy playing with a cobra because it says, point blank, that the cobra will no longer be poisonous and the children will play with those and play with a lion because they're all going to be at peace with each other. It shows Jerusalem lifted up and the Bible implies that Jerusalem will be lifted up to be the highest place on planet earth. And from there Jesus Christ will reign over all the earth, the glory of God. And it shows millions of people coming to worship Him. I love this picture. And then it says also, that the agriculture of the world will be greatly multiplied, that there will be no people who are hungry, that uh, uh, here's some references to it, that uh, the, the earth will just produce as it's never produced before, and most of all it says Satan will be bound for a thousand years, and so he won't be around to wreak havoc. Praise the Lord. But, but, it says after 1,000 years of peace, righteousness and justice that a large number of those on the earth who are in natural bodies 
will revolt against Jesus Christ. That's a sad thing. Where they come from? Well, I, where they came from is at the end of the tribulation, Jesus is going to judge everybody on planet Earth, and those who have not accepted him will be con consigned to Hades. But those who have accepted him, both Jew and Gentile, will be allowed to go into the millennium in the flesh. And they will begin to repopulate the earth. And that's going to happen very fast. By the time of that end of that thousand years, we may have as many people on earth as we have today because it says that lifespans are going to be put back the way they were at the beginning. And it says that people will live as long as a tree. I think they're going to re restore the original lifespans. And these people are going to be propagating. And the population of the world is going to grow like wildfire. And yet at the end, there's going to be this tremendous revolt against Jesus Christ. Why in the world would there be resentment in the hearts of people in the midst of the perfect reign of Jesus? Well, there's several answers to that. First, Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. With a rod of iron. That's the reason there's going to be peace, righteousness, and justice. There's going to be no instant bail or free bail or whatever. In the millennial reign of Jesus, you violate the law, you will be arrested, you will be tried, and there will be no appeal because every judge will be in a glorified body with the mind of Christ and his decision will be perfect. Everybody in a position of authority, whether they be administrators, judges, police, city councils, they will all be in glorified bodies and they will be living for the Lord and those who don't will not be tolerated. They will be dealt with immediately. And so you'll have a lot of people during the tribulation who are saying, we love you, Jesus, with their teeth gritted. Why? Because the second reason this rebellion is going to occur is people will still have that sinful nature. Those who are born during the tribulation and those who go in the millennium, they're going to still have that sinful nature. They're going to want a little sex on the side and a little booze over here and some drugs over there and some gambling over here. All the things that the, that, that, that the flesh wants. And yet there will be the rule of the rod of iron. So, oh, let me tell you something that will not exist, will not exist during the millennium. There will be no such abomination as the Texas legislature or the United States Congress. It won't exist. Because <laughs> Jesus is going to give the law, and Amen. Jesus will give it, yeah. and we will carry it out. Amen. So, there will be this great rebellion. That's the final rebellion of history. What a day that will be. And it will lead to the second battle of Gog and Magog. Revelation chapter 20. There's two battles of Gog and Magog, and sometimes people think they're the same one, but they aren't. Ezekiel 38 and 39, Russia and Muslim allies invade Israel. In Revelation 20, Russia and all the world invades to kill Jesus. The enemy is Jesus here and not Israel. And what happens is that God intervenes and He pours out His wrath from heaven and these people are all killed by fire and brimstone. And that brings us to the end of the millennium. The millennium began with two people in a, not the millennium, the, the earth, the history of the world began with two people in a perfect environment who rebelled against God. And it goes in a circle at the end all of humanity is living in a perfect society, and there's rebellion against God. It goes in circles. So why is God going to allow this rebellion in the end times? Why? Well, there's main reason, I think, is that He wants to prove something. And that is that the religion of Satan is humanism. It's the belief that man can do anything. We should worship man. And man is capable of anything if he has enough education and so forth. And God is going to prove that is not true. He's going to prove that the only hope for man is Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's man's view. The Bible view says we are born with a fallen and sinful nature. And that the only hope for mankind is Jesus Christ being baptized in the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit in the hope of life eternal with God in a new heaven, in a new Jerusalem, on a new earth, 
that Russ just talked about. I think we're going to see, I think what's going to happen at the end of that millennium, Jesus is going to judge all those alive and he's going to send to hell those who have rebelled against him and rejected him. And for those of us who are believers, who have been living in, 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 in uh, immortal bodies during that time, our resurrected bodies, I think he's going to take us off this earth. He's going to put us in that new Jerusalem that he's preparing for us right now. Oh, what a glorious place that will be. Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has the mind of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And I think from that vantage point, we're going to see the greatest fireworks display in all of history. Yes, global warming is coming. It is coming. And God's going to take this earth and he's going to burn it like a hot ball of wax. And now that fiery inferno is going to come a new heavens and a new earth that is perfected, that is set back like the earth that God originally uh, created. And then he's going to lower us down in that new Jerusalem to that new earth. And we're going to live in that new Jerusalem, in that new earth on mortal bodies forever and ever in the presence of Almighty God and Jesus Christ. It says in the book of Revelation, we shall see the face of God. And I, I believe that means they're going to have intimate relationship with our Creator forever and ever and ever. What a glorious day that will be. Yeah. It causes me every day to get up and say, Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. Today be the day Sometimes I feel Like I'm gonna break But I'm holding on To a hope that won't fail Come, Jesus, come. We've been waiting so long for the day you return to heal every hurt and right every wrong. We need you right now. Come and turn. Face to 
come and lay it all down Cause it might be today The time is right now There's no need to wait Your past will be won By rivers of grace Jesus come Maranatha. Yeah.